So, getting back to handwoven. After Jane, there was Jean Scorgi, then there was Madeline Vanderhoot, and then there will be Anita Osterhout, and they have all come to be the editor of the magazine by a different path. And they all leave their own special mark on the magazine, and I can't begin to tell all the stories about that today. But I did pastiche some little things. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. Thank you. It was the kitchen issue, yeah, and, you know, it's great. I mean, Jane, Jane made, Jane wove lots of things for the magazine, and she styled a lot of really beautiful photography over the years, but I thought this really captured the essence. <laughs> And this is Jean Scorgi, who had, has such a refined sense of design and such a wonderful way of teaching people how to, how to make great stuff. And what she's doing today that is really, really commendable is publishing a, a little newsletter that's called The Weaver's Craft. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's very, very good. It's especially for beginners who need their hands held a little bit in a good way. And here's Madeline and her famous deflected, am I right? Deflected yeah. double weave? <laughs> a deflected double weave are Madeline. <laughs> but color, too. And Madeline is just stepping aside after, is it 13 or 14 years? 12. 12, you know. After 12 years as head of the magazine. And I don't intend to be saying goodbye to her at all because we continue to expect a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> but while I'm still at Interweave today and I'm poking my nose into handwoven and spin-off and various related projects. I have developed other very strong interests, most particularly the textiles and weaving culture of the Peruvian highlands, but other areas of Central and South America. And how did that happen? Well, other than it's, that it's one of the most amazing textile traditions in the world, there is a story, and it is about collisions. So if I hadn't started the Herb Companion back in 1988, which was a whole bizarre story of its own. Jane alluded, or Marilyn alluded to it. Yeah, I did have a vision. I mean, it was like a real, you know, vision, <laughs> which is weird. I don't do that much. Um, but if that hadn't happened, then I wouldn't have started Herbs for Health in the late 1990s. And if I hadn't started Herbs for Health, I wouldn't have been struck by the <laughs> idea of a series of stories on native healers from many cultures. In which case, I wouldn't have ended up in the Amazon rainforest interviewing a shaman about his hallucinogenic plant therapies. And I wouldn't have taken a side trip from there, you know, a break in what was the very, very strange, to go up to Cusco, high up in the Andes. And therefore, I wouldn't have seen up close the, these astonishing fabrics that are being made there. And I wouldn't have met, met Nilda Cognapa, whose book I published a few years ago as a sort of a hobby project, which has led to another, several hobby projects. Somebody here, it may have been, it may have been Ann Merrill, who I work with on a daily basis now, said, so you mean to say you spent 37 years publishing books and magazines, and now you're cutting back your hours at interweek so you can go home and publish books. So yeah, that's kind of how it works. Here's, here's the first book in that series. This is uh, authored by Milda Cognapa Alvarez. It was really fun to do this. And this, this is just a couple of random snapshots I pulled out of my camera because I have about 5,000 snapshots in my camera that I never get downloaded. This lovely 
What he has his hands on there is his foot-powered loom. He's getting ready to set it up. And what it consists of is a reed and a front beam, period. And so he runs his hand-spun threads through the reed, winds them onto the front beam, runs them through, now I'm getting this backward. In any case, the other end of his the other end of his loom is a stake in the ground. And on this, and it has two petals that just kind of hang down there. And on this, he weaves all of the pants bag fabric for all of the men in his village. And it, you know, that's impressive. And this one, um, this is recent. Uh, design, uh, a redesign of a, of a little textile catalog that, uh, of the uh, museum at the Center for Traditional Textiles in Cusco. And it was just a sheer delight to work again with Michael Signorella as the designer on this, because Michael and I have a long, long history of working together that, uh, you know, kind of got interrupted there for a while, but it, it's been a real treat. It's a cute book because you turn it over and turn it upside down and the other side's in Spanish. And this was, uh, if, you're, if you're a young woman in the Andes and you're looking for a man, you dress up. <laughs> you dress up. And this woman is like, she's probably 18, and she must spend all her time weaving these incredible, you know, fancy things. And I've seen her on three different trips down there, and she never seems to get married. I think she just likes dressing <laughs> up. <laughs> but this was at an event called the Weaver's Sports Day. So these women who, you know, from villages scattered all over the Cusco district, some of them, you know, a day apart, in driving time, come together once a year in their best clothes, and they play cutthroat soccer and volleyball. And it's really quite remarkable to see. And this is another one. This uh, is a little departure from Peru. This just came off press. It's a guide to the textiles of Chiapas, which is I don't even know how to describe the textiles of Chiapas because they're all over the place. They're just amazing. This was a fun project to do as well. And this is one of the sheep of Chiapas. Isn't that amazing? And this is a woman on the street spinning in uh, one of the little villages. And this is a book that I was delighted to do with Deborah Chandler as one of the co-authors and with my colleagues, my, my former interweave colleagues who are now my Ferrums and Cloth Roads co colleagues. Uh, we did this project as a, um, as a benefit for Friendship Bridge who does uh, microloans in Guatemala. And uh, Deborah wrote the text and it was Again, a lot of fun to work on. So, you know, that's, yeah, that's my hobby, I guess. I mean, who wouldn't like to do that? And this uh, is from one of my trips to Guatemala. And in the best tradition of Mary Atwater, I followed this woman home and bought that wheat belt off of her. <laughs> uh, unlike Mary Atwater, I didn't try to trade my ratty sweatshirt for her spectacular wheat belt. And she was lovely. And this was a shot I took in, in, a, in a neighboring village of East Darling, little boys who were dying to be photographed. And this was right before one of the mothers came up and grabbed me by the neck and tried to choke me because she thought I would take that picture home and try to find people to adopt those boys. So, you know, you learn these, these little cultural sensitivities a lot of times by doing or by you know doing the wrong thing that was 
apparently a real faux pas, but the boys were really cute. And um, I don't know what else is in here. Um, okay, back to the metaphor. How can you relate any of this, any of these random stories, any of these tenuously tied events, activities, people, to a nice, tidy warp and weft? Straight edges, even tension, logical patterns. It just doesn't hold up for me. It's more like when your giant skein of yarn becomes a totally tangled mess and your yarns are crossing every which way and you have these gnarly knots that won't come out and you work and work and work at it and pick around and whole sections bit by bit resolve themselves into neatness only to be interrupted by another backward loop that you have to follow for a while. But as you untangle it, each intersection can take you in a direction that you didn't exactly anticipate. But with luck, it will finally become a neat center pool ball, eventually. Of course, by then, you may be ready to check out. But <laughs> <laughs> so I've been reading a little book called A Life of Being, Having, and Doing Enough by Wayne Muller. And I don't particularly recommend it because it's one of those self-regarded books where the author tries to tell you how to live your life because that's how he does and he's so cool. <laughs> but he makes an observation in the first chapter that I've really been thinking about a lot. And his observation is that life is a long, long string of choices, often very tiny choices. And each choice you make, whether it's to marry this person or that, or drop out of school or not, or start a business or not, or go for a run or sit down to read, or try to make a green light when it's yellow, or sign up for a weaving class just to see what that's like. If you can make each of these choices, whether they're tiny or whether they're big, based on your internal sense of comfort and rightness. And if you can accept and embrace the path each one takes you down, then you will be happy. Now, maybe not jolly happy every day, but you will be at ease with yourself and your lot. And for most of us in this room, that lot has involved spinning, weaving, textiles in one form or another. For some of us, it's been a central focus, more important than anything but our family and dearest friends. For some, it's been a diversion, a mental exercise, maybe a source of income, maybe a passing fancy. But whatever it means to you, it will surely have created connections with people, ideas, opportunities, new pathways. There's a lot of wisdom embedded in that tired old pun, you can't weave well enough along. <laughs> That's it.